Thank you for introducing. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, for this event, I decided to bring something uh, brand new about the things that I'm doing right now. And one of the things uh, I'm doing is try to predict proteins uh, combining uh, small angle X ray scattering and computational simulations. Uh, before I start, I would like to thank uh, all the organizers for the invitation uh, for this great conference, especially Professor Vitor, a uh, good friend. And I feel very glad to be here because uh, it's, it's really amazing being in a place with uh, so many smart people make me think I am a little bit smart. <laughs> but not so smart as the, the, the other uh, speakers. Uh, to start, I would like to show this is my research group. Uh, here uh, uh, is missing Vitor, a student, and Marilia that just joined the group uh, one month ago. And this is uh, uh, Neto, he's working with uh, docking. Uh, this is Rafael, works with. Uh, Conformational transitions uh, using uh, kinases, and today I'm uh, gonna work of the uh, talk about the work of Carolina and Victor that's working with uh, Sachs. Uh, I'm gonna do a introduction, talk a little bit about uh, theory. I'm uh, gonna be fast on this part, uh, especially. This this part is it's just fundamental for the students, and then uh, show some results uh, with the computational simulations and such. Uh, the first question we have to answer is why study proteins? Well, proteins are biological systems with high complexity and specialized functions. They are responsible by regulation process, cell growing, catalysis, so. It's a very important uh, uh, thing to be studied. And why you should try to determine the protein structure? Because this is the starting point of uh, many studies. Here you guys uh, saw many studies involving simulations. And in general, to start a, a, a study using simulations, you need a, a structure or a crystallography structure, or an NMR structure. In general, we need a starting point. And determining this, this uh, protein structure is our starting point. And why try to predict the protein structure? Because we know, like, have some experimental methods that cannot uh, solve the problem. For example, uh, we know that uh, uh, some proteins cannot be crystallized. So, what to do? Oh, maybe you can use the NMR, but uh, NMR has a size limitation. So, in this case, uh, you should try to predict these structures if you'd like to investigate a disease or something like that. So, uh, the Proteins, probably uh, you guys know about this, but uh, we have uh, around uh, 500 amino acids or no, but uh, proteins choose uh, only 20 types. They have uh, this type of structure, so like it's the uh, uh, one common group and a side chain that uh, differentiate one amino acid from the other. These are all the amino acids employing proteins. Here you have uh, nonpolar groups, polar groups, uh, and this I think it was uh, already discussed uh, here. The other thing uh, that I should introduce is that we classify 
uh, the proteins by primary, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary. Uh, here I, I will use only primary, secondary, and tertiary uh, structures. And the primary is the sequence of amino acids. And secondary is the local arrangement of these proteins. We are showing here, for example, alpha helix and beta sheet. And this is the tertiary structure. And to understand the, the ideas of uh, uh, studying of proteins, I really like to show this result of Christian Anthensen in the 70s, where he took uh, ribonuclease A, uh, put this uh, ribonuclease A in a solution of urea and meta ethanol, and the protein uh, opens. Oh, he checked that this protein opened. Like uh, ribonuclease have a uh, uh, seven disulfide bonds, and he counts uh, the number of uh, disulfide bonds formed. So we can understand here that uh, you can have one protein folded, you put uh, any kind of denaturant in this protein, you won't fold, and if you return to the initial conditions, the proteins will refold. This is a, a fantastic result because now you can understand that it's not, a uh, it's not necessary a biological machinery to fold the protein because the protein has all the information in its sequence. So you don't need, like uh, maybe people uh, previous this publication could think that uh, uh, the ribosomes do the fold in the protein, but now you know, like uh, it's just the interactions that uh, are necessary to fold the proteins. And this starts like two main problems, like uh, the protein prediction based on the sequence of amino acids, and what I think uh, I call the protein folding problem that is in the understanding of the mechanism involved in the process of protein folding. Uh, here we see, we saw many of uh, cases studying these mechanisms and the importance of the understanding these mechanisms. So I'll focus on protein prediction. Probably this is the most viewed figure <laughs> during this event. Like I think everybody uh, here in his presentation, almost everybody show the funnel and talk about the energy, the, the balance between energy and configurational entropy and show free energy profiles with the reaction coordinates and knows that this theory is based on the minimum of minimal, uh, the principle of the minimal frustration and landscape energy. So I skip this one. And then we talk a lot also about uh, minimal models. And every time I, I try to explain what's a minimal model, in general, I would like to show the total, like uh, Vitor's presentations, that I think it's the uh, most uh, uh, easy uh, form to understand uh, uh, the idea of the minimal models. That is like put only the necessary information to understand the process and no more. So here, like uh, trying to be as smart as Vitor, I prepare one video that in my mind resumes what's a minimal model, but in music. Uh, this is a guy from Jamaica and uh, he uses a minimal acoustic guitar. Like, you can check, there's only one string. <laughs> one thing to <laughs> calibrate the tension. And 
And you can do music. <laughs> so, like, uh, uh, I think this is a good representation about a uh, minimal model. Because this is a minimal guitar, and we are looking uh, in our systems, is the minimal information about what is necessary to do the prediction or do the, the mechanism of folding. So, like, uh, this is one publication just uh, uh, to illustrate uh, the minimal model. Here we have a CI2 and one representation of a C alpha, C beta model. The red uh, bits are the C alpha, the blue bits are the C beta. And you can see like the dis differences here. We, in this model, we put the C beta in the center of the center of mass just to try to differentiate one residue from another, like uh, alanine, for example, of uh, tryptophan, because they have like a, a different sense of mass of the side chain. And this potential also everybody knows, like it's the, the, the bonds by the harmonic potentials, the angles, the dihedros, the uh, 10, 12 uh, uh, Lerner Jones potential. So nothing new here. Then uh, I have to give some uh, insights about the New uh, some fundamentals about the X, uh, small angle X-ray scattering. It's a technique of low resolution, able to solve uh, the size and the shape. And the result, it's uh, in general an uh, envelope. You don't have information about the three-dimensional positions, but you have uh, uh, these results of the uh, this this uh, uh, idea of the shape of the protein. Okay. In general, the advantages is we don't need a crystal sample to perform the resolution. You can use, for example, the protein solution. This is a, 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 a great thing because you can study conformational changes and compare conformational changes uh, in silico and in, in vitro. And practically, we don't have a molecular mass limitation, uh, as is the case of NMR. And what can be a disadvantage is that uh, the result is a ver uh, it's an averaging of the structures in solution. So you're going to see this is not a, a disadvantage for me. In Brazil, you have uh, this. Uh, Laboratório Nacional de Luz Synchrotron, LNLS, uh, in English Brazilian Synchrotron Light Laboratory. Uh, this is, this in, uh, is, is located at Campinas, São Paulo. Uh, today we have this uh, UVX working. Uh, uh, this uh, it's. Uh, uh uh, synchrotron with uh, several beam lines. Uh, this is the new project uh, that is const in construction right now, the Sirius. Uh, and in U UVX, you have these two lines, the SAX2 and SAX1. And SAX2 is, uh, is not working at this time just because uh, people are using this line to calibrate the light of the series, uh, the, 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 the line of the series. So this become an experimental station to help the construction of the new uh, synchrotron. And we have SAX1, like uh, I had uh, one time the opportunity to spend three days. Well, the things are were really remains there. It's like a, and if you would like to to use this beam line, you just have to apply uh, uh, your project, and it's free. So it's uh, it's pretty convenient. It's pretty good. Uh, and. In the new, we'll have this 
uh, in series you have these lines. You have only one uh, uh, sax uh, beam line that you have the name of Sapucaia, that is a, a Brazilian tree. And all the names of the line, I don't know if all, but the most part of the names of the, the lines are names of uh, Brazilian trees. How sax works? Yeah, you have uh, uh, X-ray source. This X-ray source, you pass for a collimator. The collimator you cross a uh, sample. In general, what you do is use like uh, the the buffer, the, the solution, and then like uh, the 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 buffer of the 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 protein there and subtract the 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 protein with the buffer minus the buffer, and you get a, a scattered uh, uh, image that is that shows the momentum transfer vector. To, to understand this momentum transfer vector, you pay attention to this representation. This is the incident ray. This is the scatter ray. And here you have one geometry that shows that we can write this uh, momentum transfer vector as a function of the difference of the uh, incident uh, ray uh, and the scattered ray. So some equations here, you can like uh, uh, conveniently assume the amplitude and t intensity uh, as equal values. You put one here just to become the prob problem easier. And the magnitude is the phase uh, is given by 2 pi uh, over lambda multiplied by the, uh, the optical path of the rays, uh, incident and scattering, giving to you a phase of the 2 pi RV over lambda. You can analyze the figure and uh, for uh, P sine of with the magnitude of Q divided by lambda. And then if you check with V is given by 2 sine of theta, then you can see here 2 sine of theta and then write Q like 2 pi over lambda uh, plus v, and then define the phase just by the uh, momentum transfer and r. And then, if you apply the electronic density, then you can write uh, the phase by the uh, exponential of minus uh, i q r. This will give the amplitude. This is the Fourier transform of the phase and if you do the, the uh, inverse Fourier transform you can get the density but uh, if you check this to get the intensity you, uh, you, you must to calculate uh, 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 the A by uh, its complex conjugate, and if you do that, you lost the phase. So you have a problem here, because <laughs> the most important thing that was the phase to, to determine the positions, you just get lost. So to perform this calculation, you consider uh, this integral and try to solute in, in, in solution, uh, uh, try one solution in two steps. That consists in calculating the outcome relation function and integration in the reciprocal space. Uh, the first part, you can use uh, the relative distance, this r, and uh, get the density of points given by this uh, expression. And the integration in the reciprocal space you provide to us a new Fourier transform where the intensity will depends only of the sample of the conformation. Uh, where you can ca calculate the inverse of Fourier transform, uh, obtain a relationship between the real and the reciprocal space. Uh, with that, using the 
law of uh, reciprocity, then you can reach uh, this equation that's called the by approximation. This is the uh, important equation in this work. So I will show it one more time in future. So let's show some results using the SACS and computational simulations. Uh, the first uh, 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 study we performed was using this protein CSK. It was one invitation of uh, Patricia Jennings uh, and Paul Whitford to work on this project. And the thing is like uh, this CSK protein, the carboxyl terminal CERC kinase. It's a protein of uh, 450 residues and composed by uh, four domains, the SA3 domain, SA2 domain, small lobe in C-terminal lobe domain. And if you, you take a look on the uh, PDB structure solved by Ogawa, you're going to see like uh, one crystal with uh, six uh, monomers. And they arrange basically in two forms, one with the domain SA2 down and another with the domain S and other with the domain SH2 up. And Ogawa decided to uh, define this as the active form and this as an inactive form. Then, uh, and this, this protein is very important because uh, it's a, 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 a main uh, regulator of all family of CERC uh, kinases. Uh, it's important for phosphorylation, cell growing, control, uh, uh, and differentiating. And it's associated to several types of cancers like breast, prostate, uh, colon, pancreas, leukemia, lymphoma, and so. The control of these cancers is uh, regulated by CSK, and CSK is a little bit different of the other uh, kinases of its family. If you take a look, for example, in CERC, that was the first protein of this family, here is the SA3, SA2 domain, the small lobe, and the C-terminal lobe. And if you check this in, in its inactive form and active form, you can see a big conformational change here. But in CSK, Ogawa is telling us that's just this little change. So we start to question like uh, this change. So what's the best thing to do in this point? Like try to solve, again, by crystallography, the same structure. But Patricia's groups could not uh, uh, do the, the, the crystal of this protein. I, I don't understand pretty well how this thing works in, in uh, for experimentals because like uh, in crystallography, sometimes people say, oh, I can do, I cannot do. Depends on the day, the time. The, the <laughs> I don't know how this thing works. It's, uh, I'm not criticizing the experimentalists. I'm just uh, telling that is, uh, it, it's complicated. I'm too much. Uh, I have my fundamentals in mathematics. And to me, 2 plus 2 is always 4. <laughs> But uh, as we could not uh, uh, solve this crystal structure, you decided to do a sax. So if you do a sax, I have the positions of the, prot uh, the, the atoms of the protein. Then I can like construct an envelope and reproduce the experimental curve. Everything's fine and good. But when I get the, the conformations, I try the monomer, and the monomer is not able to fit the curve. And then I say, no, I can get uh, all the combinations of uh, dimers in the crystal structure, but it's not uh, uh, able to fit the curve even because uh, it, it represents more mass than I have in the scattering profile. So we start to use the technique of uh, rigid body models. So like uh, we just uh, put these four domains and allow the, uh, them like uh, just uh, rotate in all directions and move. 
in check if you can like uh, fit the curve, but didn't work here also. So we start to think, ah, oh, maybe we can do one simulation in tropically driven. So what we did was use this idea of uh, let the the rigid body models, the, this this rigid bodies like uh, these rigid domains, just uh, uh, go around, but using structure-based models. So in in our construction, you just uh, disconnect the interactions between the domains. So like uh, I just keep the intra domain interactions, and because this I I'm telling you guys that I'm using uh, in tropically driven uh, simulation. So the simulations uh, reveal this uh, uh, free energy profile, where you have two basins, and then as SACs give to me an average of the conformation solution, I start to do uh, the combination of uh, the representative structures of from these two basins. And when I do that, doing a linear combination, then I can reconstruct the curve, like uh, here. For example, in this case, I have 20% uh, uh, of this uh, basin 1 uh, candidates. And here I have, uh, uh, no, it's 30% and 70% here. But the combination of this guy pr allows me to reconstruct this scattering curve. So what I understand is like this protein, it's it, it has two ensembles in solution. OK. Then this idea was uh, employed in other uh, publications. For example, here to understand the, the polycystic uh, disease that it's a, 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 a important uh, uh, disease uh, in kidney and to understand how kinase uh, uh, switch from one structure to, to other in presence of uh, the MPPNP. This is a kind of a stable ATP for, for analysis and in ADP. And we can see here is just uh, uh, the radius of generation by the uh, probability and we mix structure from here, 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 and we can reconstruct the curve. Here you get a from here, 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 and all, all with, with the combination of this guy, you can reconstruct the sax curves. So after that, uh, we think this is this is a work with uh, in collaboration with Vitor and uh, people from uh, CTBR. We decided to use the same uh, technology to try to uh, produce biofuels of second generation, but in a low uh, price. The idea here it was like uh, really funny because we it was me and uh, Kota, who is one uh, collaborator from there. Look, just. Uh, drinking coffee and discussing, and I asked to him, like, uh, hey, man, like, uh, we are trying to do a cocktail of uh, enzymes to produce uh, second generation biofuels, and what is cheaper than produce two enzymes? He just answered, produce one. And then the click, oh, maybe you can fuse this protein in one protein, then we have to produce only one. And that was the idea. You got a chylonase and a lysinase, and with these two proteins, I just uh, uh, fuse it one another, like it's a, a, I did by a, a, I did a, a computational program to do that. And then what I did was like doing the same simulations like uh, in tropically driven. And I got a free energy profile with the most of the structures here. Then what I did was evaluate the uh, SASA or SAS in my case and the residues to see 
uh, if you have like a big change here and the root mean square, square fluctuation to check how the, the fluctuation of the, the residue positions are being affected by the connection of the two proteins. And what you can see here, it's like a little bit decrease of the activity of the, uh, the, the uh, zillanize and one small increase of the uh, lichenize. And then, like, uh, of course, uh, theory needs experiments, so people go to the lab and he did the the diffusion, uh, did here a, a, a gel, and then we go to the synchrotron and home scattering curve and comparing with the uh, uh, computational result and fits perfectly. So great, you reach the goal. Now you can like. Uh, uh, do this kind of uh, chimeras, like it by computational checking, of course, uh, with the ac activation side, the, the the catalytic side is it's available and all this stuff, and that differ difference of the fluctuations also can be checked here in the when you compare, you see an increase of the activity of this guy and a decrease of this guy around the 20%. So, works pretty well. The other thing you'd like to do, also involving uh, 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 second generation of uh, biofuse, was use this protein that is a beta mananase. It was a, a, a collaboration with Professor Vonius Garcia and he showed to me this uh, protein with this peak on uh, a pH of around the close of 6, is 5.5. And then he, he told me, oh, I took some, some uh, SACS data and I saw some different envelopes maybe you can investigate why these envelopes are different and explain why this guy has more activity than the other two guys. So at this time, I remember the frustratometer of uh, Diego. I say, oh, maybe uh, the first thing I should do is check the frustration, this protein. And then like I run the frustratometer and the frustratometer showed to me uh, a region here really frustrated. Say, okay, this region may be really frustrated, but probably is not frustrated for all the pH. I can have uh, a balance between protonation and the protonation depends on the, the pH. And then what you could see is that like the, the, the situation with pH 8, it's the protein really uh, collapsed and because this is, is not so easy, the access of the, the sugar to the catalytic site. When you go to pH 6, then you have one extension of this loop, and this loop is charged, so he induces the sugar to come to to catalytic site, like it's uh, a, a, a kind of arm trying to capture the sugar to to the protein, and the accessibility here, the volume of the cavity is a little bit uh, bigger. And in this case, you're gonna think, oh, maybe, so to four, I must have a better result. No, 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 you don't have it, because you still continuing having this extension of the loop but you change the protonation of the active site. So it's not possible to fix the, 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 the sugar there and perform the hydrolysis. So this is one case where we do not do, did uh, simulations using the charge. Here, uh, the only thing I did was disconnect the, the interactions between this loop 
and the, re the rest of the, the protein, but uh, intermediates the idea of the whole charge can interfere on this problem. And then here you have the, the variation, the volume in the surface, and the protonation is too small, but it's, it's explained. So with this base, what was the idea? How? Construct a web server to predict the protein in solution. Why? Because so many uh, experimentalists would like to have an uh, automa automatized uh, tool to go to the synchrotron, perform your measurements, and then just uh, uh, put in the computer and have the results. Some guys uh, are not like me, that like uh, stay all day in the computer, writing programs and doing simulations. Like, uh, and the most important is understand what's going on in the, the biological uh, uh, in the biological environment. So the idea here is have uh, construct a web server where you can evaluate the ch uh, changes in the, the proteins, like change in solution, like uh, conformation of chains, identify representative ensembles in solution, do this reconstruction of SACS profiles, as I show in, in two articles previously, and try to do a prediction of the protein structure based the exclusively in the primary sequence and uh, using SACS data and computational simulations. How do you do that? Like First, uh, you define the secondary structure. Uh, for a while, you're using, like if you give to me a PDB, I can get this uh, uh, secondary structure from the PDB. If you give to me the uh, primary sequence, I can um, predict the secondary structure. You know, you have uh, around 83% of, uh, 83 of uh, uh, chances of uh, assert uh, uh, on this case, then what do you do? Like if you have a, a, a helices or a beta sheet, you keep these regions uh, frozen, and in the coil regions, you allow the rotations using the uh, phi and c angles. It's like a Hamachandran plot. And then we start to do perform uh, aleatory rotations using Monte Carlo simulations. The rotation is basically a, a, a Euler a, a matrix of rotation. So like uh, you, do you perform these rotations in three axes. Uh, uh, it's not a big deal. And the total energy will be given by the adjust of the SACS data, like the, the scattering profile and the computational calculated profile, but you have uh, to avoid the term of the learner jones uh, the sobreposition of the atoms. So here uh, is uh, the by formula that we use to calculate the, scatter the theoretical scattering profiles. Here we use a, a form factor to fill these variables. These uh, uh, formulas you can use, like uh, for each element, you have uh, one value of A1, B1, A2, is just uh, substitute the values here, and then you can get the form factor and calculate this chi square. That is the difference between the experimental intensity uh, and the theoretical intensity divided by the experimental standard deviation. The web server, it's in its first version, is really simple. We are using the, the Google idea of keeping things simple. <laughs> like, uh, so it's just one uh, field to put the PDB or fa fast, FASTA, and the SACS data, and then you go to send, and it calculates for like a one hour or two hour, and you can resubmit the, the, the things if you need more results. Uh, here I'm going to show some results. For example, this is Vilin. It's the initial confirmation, for example. This is our result after two hours, and this is 
our result after four hours. I think it's pretty decent, but like uh, Vlink is a uh, simple case to to fold. You have a, a more successful, uh, good results, but I'd like to also show bad results because all the events are go. People just show good results. They don't show bad results. I'd like to show some bad results. Um, this is, for example, two bad results. This, you can see like a really wrong rotation, like this helix would be here. It's bad, but it's not so bad. We think uh, it would be possible to fix this problem pretty soon. And this guy also, like it's just one rotation here, probably you solve this problem. So I think the, the web server is in its first version, but it was, it's working pretty well. And for a future work, we would like to include uh, MD simulations, like uh, I think in the fi final steps, MD could be better than Monte Carlo simulations because of this pivot moving, like uh, it's it's a large movement and molecular dynamics can be more driven to the, the correct uh, 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 final structure. We would like to make available more secondary structure uh, options for pre the prediction. For a while we are using the IPSI-PRED, but we would like to use uh, uh, more options. Uh, you'd like to inc include uh, a eight bound uh, potential. This is because, of course, if you have like uh, the secondary structure just uh, froze. And if you have, a, 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 for example, a beta sheet that is, uh, that suffers a torsion, then our model will not be able to solve this problem. So if you include uh, this kind of uh, uh, eight bound potential, just for the secondary structure, I think this is, you provide to us better results. The other thing, you probably you guys must be, uh, probably you guys saw the presentation of uh, Francisco, Antonio Francisco uh, from UNB, that talk about the burial potentials. Here you'd like to include burial potentials also here to try to refine more and more uh, uh, the final structure. Combine representative confirmations and allow the user to select these uh, options, but only that one that, that he wants. So, if you can, like if you work with SOX or would like to, to, to check, like, uh, please test the web server. Let me know what you think. It's good, it's bad, like uh, it's important to me. Uh, if your research can help mine, feel uh, red invited for a coffee. If my research can help your uh, 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 research, please invite me for a coffee. I always say yes for coffee. And I finish here with a, a, a picture of our department. Thanks for your attention and I'm open for questions. <laughs>